Great. So today we are going to be talking about assignment three, which is my favorite assignment of the year. Um, hopefully yours too. It's where we really start to get into, we'll say the, the true game programming stuff. Um, I guess we've been doing game programming, but it's where our games start to look like real games. We're going to talk about animations, um, all sorts of, of cool stuff. So let's just jump right into assignment three. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just demo it for you. So let's see the solution right here. Okay, so you can see this, it's just about full screen. Let me make the back part a bit darker, perfect. All right, so the game we're making, so I'm gonna demo the game, then I'll go over the readme file, and then I'll go over the code, just like I always do. So let's do that. Um, so here, our game is called Mega Mario. As you can see, when you start the game, there's a menu. Down here, the menu has some controls. Um, so now we're getting into different scenes. So there is going to be a menu scene in this game. Uh, there's going to be multiple levels that you can choose from. And then if I choose to play the game, then I will be in that level. So as you can see here, we've got a bit of a Mega Man slash uh, Mario Brothers mashup going on. So this is what you'll be doing for assignment three. So I'm going to go over all of the mechanics that I can remember for this game. And then we'll go into the readme file to really dig down into the, uh, the details of what you have to do for the assignment. So obviously in the assignment, there are some sort of uh, things that you can walk on and collide with. So if you hit uh, A, you're gonna go left. You're not gonna be able to go um, off of the side of the screen. If you hit D, you're gonna go right. And there are things in which you are going to uh, bang into. If you jump, you can jump. If you jump and release the jump button early, you'll jump, you know, if you hold the jump button, you'll go to your full height. If not, then you'll go partial height. If you hit the space bar, you're going to fire a bullet. That bullet will go um, some distance in, in that direction, or it'll have some sort of lifespan. If your bullet hits something, then it's going to be destroyed. Uh, if I jump into the bottom of a brick, that brick is going to be destroyed and an animation is going to play. So here, if I jump into this brick, the same thing's going to happen. And as well as if I shoot a brick, that brick is going to be destroyed. Um, for these coin blocks, you can see uh, it's a little subtle, but there is an animation to this coin block. It's kind of going, it's fading in from dark to light, dark to light, so that's also an animation. And if I hit from under, if I hit above on a coin block, nothing happens, I just stand there. If I hit from below on a coin block, a little coin animation plays above the coin. And then if I hit it again, nothing happens. So we have to have some sort of way to record, you know, okay, this block has been hit already and all sorts of stuff like that. If I keep going, you can see that there are pipes. Oh, there's a hole. What happens if I hit the hole? Nothing, right? Also, there are clouds. What happens if I hit the clouds? Nothing. So there has to be some way for me to specify, you know, some things in the level I actually hit and some things in the level I don't hit. So if we keep playing here, there's gonna be uh, more bricks. Uh, over here, for example, I can either choose to go the long way up and around here, so I can do this, or I could have chose to shoot through and jump that way if I wanted to. Um, once I cross the bricks, I reach the sort of canonical end of a Mario level, and if I touch the flagpole, I'm finished and I go back to the start of the level. Okay, so that's the game that we're making. There's a surprising amount of stuff that goes into this. So, um, yeah, just realize that, that this assignment, there's going to be a lot of programming in this assignment, and it might take a lot of debugging. So, that's the entire Mario Mega Man Mega Mario game. That uh, That's all that I can show, because that's all the game mechanics. But what I'm going to do is go over the readme file, and as we need to, I'm going to show you like the actual details of how all that's implemented. So let me close this. I've got the code open for the assignment here in the background, but I'm not going to, um, to do that yet. I'm going to open the readme file first. So up here, uh, first we just have the standard, okay, you're going to zip the source file and send me all of that, put your names at the top. That's going to be the same from here on. So this is exactly the same as assignment two. Now down to the program specification. So in this assignment, you'll be writing a game that was presented in class. So that's the Mega Mario game. And the game must have the following features. 
assets. So now we have assets in the game. Entities in the game will be rendered with various textures and animations, which we will be calling assets, along with fonts. So we have to display some fonts to the screen, so fonts are also assets. Assets are loaded once at the beginning of the program and stored in the assets class, which is stored by the game engine class. All of the assets are stored in or defined in assets.txt with the syntax defined below. So if we go into our folder, I know this is a little bit small. I apologize for my small font. Um, this is the bin folder of the assignment, and it comes with the solution that you can run if you're on Windows. It also comes with a fonts folder that has three fonts in it. Um, it also comes with an images folder, which has uh, images from Mario. So here are all the Mario textures that we're using. Uh, from Mega Man, so here's some Mega Man textures that we're using, and then some miscellaneous ones. So we have the coin spinning, and we also have an explosion animation. And you can see here that if I open this up, that the coin animation is just all the different frames of that animation in a row. I'll close that, I'll open up the explosion, and the explosion animation is all the different frames of that explosion in a row. Similar with Mega Man running, all of the um, textures for animations are defined from left to right, just as we saw them in the, in the, the previous lecture. So those are the files, um, and of course the source code is in the source folder, etc. We have a file here called assets, and assets are defined, well, we'll see how they're defined now, when I'm, I'm going to go explain the assets first before we do anything else. So here's the assets file, here's the readme file. Let's go down and look at the assets file. All right, so the assets file specification. There will be three different line types in the assets file, each of which correspond to a different type of asset. They are as follows. So there's texture assets, there's animation assets, and there are font assets. Oops, sorry for the scrolling. So the texture, Asset is very easy. Um, it's texture, the, so the word texture appears to let you know that it's a texture. Then n is the name, and that's going to be a string. And then p for path is a file path with no spaces in it. So I'm making this easy on you, there are no spaces. So if we come down here to the assets file, you'll see a bunch of textures. So there's texture, for example, and I'm putting the, the, the string tex, so tech stand, tech run, tech air, etc. to specify that they're texture names. And then afterwards you see that since this is run from the bin directory, inside the bin directory there's an images directory, and so that's how we're specifying our images. So images slash megaman slash run64, that is the texture containing the run animation. So that's how textures work. Next, if we scroll down, we're going to see some animations. So animations have four parameters. So first we see the word animation. Then we have, again, the name of the animation. Then we have the name of the texture associated with that animation. So that's the texture that we're going to load. And the following two integers are the number of frames of animation that are stored in that texture and the speed at which we want to run that animation. So again, the speed um, is... it. I guess it should have been called duration, but it's essentially the, the number of frames before you change to the next frame of animation in the texture. Okay, so that's how animations work, very, very simple. And finally, we have fonts, and fonts are just like textures. They are, you see the word font, then you see the name of the font, and then you see the file path of the font. Okay, so all of our textures are specified here, with the only caveat being that um, the texture used in the animation has to be defined before the texture because I'm loading in all the textures before I load in all the animations, okay? So if you have an animation here and you wanna use a texture, just make sure that the texture appears before the animation because the animation is gonna say, hey, create this animation with this texture and if the texture doesn't exist, you're gonna have an error. All right, so that's that's all the animation stuff. That's that's pretty easy to understand. And I'll get into how the animations are actually stored and loaded once I get into the uh, the code itself. So if you're, I'll I'll show you the assets class, but I I want to um, 
to get through all of this before I do that. Alrighty. So that's the assets. A quick note before we get on with everything else. This is very, very um, important. So a note is that all entity positions in this assignment denote the center of their rectangular sprite. So I said in the last lecture that this is how we're going to be doing things going forward, and that's true. So if I have uh, an entity at a particular location, whereas previously that used to mean the top left of the entity, now it's going to be the center of the entity. This, it also denotes the center of its bounding box, um, if it has one. So that's also the center of the bounding box. And this is set via sprite.setOrigin in the animation class constructor. So this is already done for you. You do not have to use, you, you don't have to specifically call set origin. It's already done for you. But just note that in this assignment, whenever you do all of your math, the position of the entity is going to be the center of the entity, not the top left of the entity. So we have several different types of entities in this game. The first type of entity is the player entity. So the player entity in the game is represented by Mega Man which has several different animations. Standing, running, and air, meaning jumping, I guess. You must determine which state the player is in and, correct, and assign the correct animation. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back and we'll open up our game. So if we look, when Mega Man is just standing here, he has this stand animation. Okay, so he's just standing there, just stand. The stand animation if we go back and look at the assets file, um, so down here, I'll show you in a sec. I know it's covering up. So down here, we have animation stand that uses the stand texture. It has one frame of animation. And because it just has one frame of animation, then the speed doesn't matter, right? We're never actually transitioning the frame if it only has one frame of animation. We have the run animation. It has four frames of animation and we have 10 um, duration on each of those frames. And then we have air and that is one frame of animation. So we don't need to speed. So if we launch our game again, we can see that when Mega Man is just standing, he's using the stand animation. When he's in the air, it's the air animation. So it's just that arms up sort of jumping animation. And when he's running back and forth, he's using the run animation, which is four frames of animation. So what you have to do as the game programmer is you somehow have to detect what state Mega Man is in and assign the correct animation based on that, okay? And in, this, in, in our architecture for this assignment, all you have to do to assign a different animation is just reassign the animation. That's it. So if you add a new animation component, then it will just overwrite the previous animation component. So it's, it's pretty easy to do. Okay. So let's get back to the, uh, here we go. So the player moves with the following controls. So it's left is A, right is D, W is jump, and shoot is the space key. That's it. That's all you have to do for the controls. The player can move left, move right, or shoot at any time during the game. That means that the player can move left or right in the air. So if the player is in the air, let me run this again, I can move left or right while I'm in the air. But what the next line is going to show is that if I'm in the air, I can't jump again. Okay, so you have to be able to detect that I am currently in the middle of a jump and or I'm currently in the air and I can't jump from the air. I have to be on the ground in order to be jumping or in order to be able to jump. Uh, okay. If the player, uh, sorry, yeah, the player can only jump if it's currently standing on a tile. Oops. Just had uh, Windows news pop up. All right. If the jump key is held, the player should not continuously jump, but instead it should only jump once per button press. If the player lets go of the jump key mid jump, it should start falling back down immediately. So that means that if I hold the jump key, I'll jump a bit higher than if I release the jump key. Next, if the player moves left or right, the player's sprite will face in that direction until the other direction has been pressed. 
So you can see here, uh, again, I'll just run the assignment. Mega Man starts out facing to the right. As I'm running to the right, Mega Man is facing to the right. If I run to the left, Mega Man is facing to the left. Um, there's only one animation for Mega Man running. So what you can do is you can set the scale of Mega Man. So if you set the scale of a sprite to the X value to negative one, it will flip in the X direction. So what you can do is if Mega Man is running to the right, you set the, the player's entity, you set their scale, well, the scale isn't a component, the scale is part of the transform. So if running to the right, you get the transform of the player and you set its scale X value to one. If it's running to the left, you set its scale X value to negative one and that will take care of it for you. It essentially flips it in the X direction. Bullets shot by the player travel in the direction that the player is facing. So you have to be able to tell which direction the player is facing. Um, the player collides with tile entities in the level, and we'll talk about the level syntax later, and cannot move through them. The player lands on a tile and stands in place if it falls on it from above. So if you land on a tile from above, it will just stand there. So tiles are one type of non-player entity. The other type of non-player entity is called a deck or decoration. And they're just specified as tile or deck in the, in the level file. So decks have no collision. So we fall right through them. And those are like the clouds and the bushes in the background. The player, if the player falls below the bottom of the screen, they respawn at the start of the level. Um, the player should have a gravity component, which constantly accelerates it downward on the screen until it collides with a tile. So that's pulling us downward in the level. The player has a maximum speed specified in the level file, which should not exceed in the X or Y directions. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the player will be given a bounding box of a side spe specified in the level file. And the player's sprite and bounding box are centered on the player's position. That's it. That's it for the player. Animations. All right. So we already talked about the uh, specification for animations in the, in the file. Animations are implemented by storing multiple frames inside a texture. So we talked about that in the last lecture. The animation class handles frame advancement based on an animation speed. Talked about that already. You need to implement the animation update function to properly progress animations. You need to implement the animation has ended function, which will return true if an animation has finished its last frame, false otherwise. Animations can be repeating either loop forever or non-repeating play once. And we'll talk about that when we get back um, into the specification for the animation um, class. Any entity with a non-repeating animation should be destroyed once its animation has ended returns true. So what does that mean? Well, let's have a look. Some entities in the game are going to have animations which we want to loop. Right? So for example, Mega Man running to the right, this animation we want to loop. So that is a repeated animation. This uh, coin block here, that has a repeating animation, right? So it's it goes in between, I think there's three frames of animation here. It goes from light to dark, light to dark, light to dark. However, there are some animations that we do not want to repeat. And so for example, one of the animations we don't want to repeat is this explosion animation. So what happens is in your collision system, you're going to, um, and I'll, I'll describe this in more detail in a bit, but when you detect that the player has hit a brick from below, you're going to change the bricks animation from brick to explosion. Then you're going to tell the system that the explosion anima animation is non-repeating. Meaning that once the animation system has detected that an that animation has finished, then it it gets this it gets destroyed. Okay. Similarly, we may want animations to have that same sort of duration when we, for example, hit this brick here. Okay. But this one is a little bit different because we want this animation 
Well, I'll, I'll talk about that animation when I get to it. But essentially, there are, there are some animations that are repeating, some animations that are non-repeating. And non-repeating animations, like this explosion, we destroy the entity that, that plays that explosion after its animation has finished. Okay, so that's what that is saying. Decoration entities. So decoration entities are simply drawn to the screen. They do not interact with any entities in the game in any way, okay? So there are tile entities and deck entities. Deck are just decorations. Decorations can be given any animation in the game, but intuitively they should be reserved for things like clouds, bushes, etc. Tiles. Tiles are entities that define the level geometry and interact with the players. Tiles can be given an animation that's defined in the asset file. Tiles will be given a bounding box equal to the size of their animation. Okay, so you're going to say um, tile get component animation dot animation dot get size. This is how you're able to get the size of the animation. We are going to have a new syntax for getting and setting components. I will explain that in a little bit when we get to it. Um, but just realize that we are going to have get component and set component functionality now inside our entities, which makes things nicer. Um, the current animation displayed for a tile can be retrieved with, and so you can get the name of the animation. So for example, if I want to loop through all my tiles to see which ones are bricks, then I can say, okay, uh, get the animation and get the name of that animation. And I can see if it's a brick or not. Tiles are going to have different behavior depending on which animation they are given. So brick tiles, bricks are given the brick animation. When a brick collides with a bullet or is hit by a player from below, its animation should be set to explosion, non-repeating. Non-repeating animations are destroyed when has ended is equal to true. So you're going to have to detect that. And its bounding box component should be removed. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I load my game again, if I hit this brick, as soon as I hit the brick, it changes into an explosion animation, but my bounding box gets, gets removed as well. So just watch. So I can pass through the bounding box. Oh, I forgot that I actually have some debug functionality in here. Uh, what are the keys for that again? Ah, nope. Okay, so here, if you press the C key, you can actually see all of the bounding boxes for everything in the game. If I hit the T key, I can toggle off the textures. So T toggles off textures, C toggles off um, collisions. So here you can see essentially what the game engine is seeing. Okay, so if I hit this brick, it's bounding, excuse me, it's bounding box gets immediately removed. So this is a really good way to play the game in order to debug things. Okay, so you're not, um, sort of distracted by the, um, by the textures in the game, you can actually see what your collision system is seeing. All right, so hit, hit T to do that. I, I listed in the config file, I just haven't um, looked at it yet. All right, so that's brick tiles. Question tiles. Question tiles are given the question animation when created. When a question tile is hit from below, two things happen. Its animation changes to the darker question two animation and a temporary lifespan entity with the coin animation should appear for 30 frames, 64 pixels above the location of the question entity. So again, we'll show that. And 30 frames is essentially half a second. So boom, half a second. Okay, uh, my, my solution may actually play that for a full second, I'm not sure, but it appears 64 pixels above. All of our tiles in the game are 64 pixels uh, in height. So that's why it's 64 pixels above. So that's all the tiles. Drawing. Entity rendering has been implemented for you. You do not need to change the rendering system. So that's good news for you. Bonus. Any special effects which do not alter gameplay can be added for up to 5% bonus marks on the assignment. Note that assignments cannot go above 100 total marks, but that 5% um, could, be, could cover up other marks that uh, you've lost in the assignment. You may also develop a special weapon 
that has special effects which should contribute to the 5% bonus marks on the assignment. And what I want to do is show off some of the more impressive things in the class as well. So miscellaneous, uh, the P key should pause the game, T toggles textures, C toggles drawing bounding boxes, G toggles on and off the grid, which I'll show in a second and explain. Um, those should all be very helpful for debugging. The escape key should go back to the main menu or quit if you're on the main menu. So here, if I press D, I'm playing the game. If I press escape, I'm back to the main menu. If I press escape again, I quit the game. I've already implemented the menu for you, so you don't have to worry about that. Level creation. For this assignment, you are also required to create your own level. This level should include some interesting gameplay. Include this level in the zip file as level.txt, and I will show off some of the more interesting levels in class after the assignment is due. So inside the bin folder, there are different levels. Um, so level one is here specified for you. It has a very easy to read format, which I will specify, I'll, I'll show you um, in a little bit. Uh, level two is here. So level two, if I go play that one, it's very, very simple. Here we go. It's just a level like this and I can jump off and, and appear back at the level at the start. Level three is the same as level two. So I've only implemented level one for you. And what I'd like to see from you is you design your own interesting level and include it in the zip file as level.txt. Okay, so please try. I've seen some people just hand back in like five tiles and call that a level. No, like, you know, at least a hundred tiles of something that does something interesting. Okay, recreate one of your favorite levels from, you know, uh, your favorite game or something like that. But don't include any new textures. Okay, I don't want new file submissions. Um, so in order to include new textures, they have to be in the bin images folder, and then you have to have a new assets class or a new assets um, thing. Don't include new textures for this assignment for the bonus stuff. I'll do all of that stuff in code and in your level, please. All right, so we talked already about the assets file specification. The last thing we have to spe uh, talk about is the level file specification. So game levels will be specified by a level file, I've already showed you one of those, which will contain a list of entity specifications, one per line. It will also contain a single line which specifies properties of the player in that level. In this way, you can define an entire level in the data file, rather than programming it in code. So this is really, really good, right? Because now we have level files, we can specify all of that in data. So now we can start separating the functionality of our game into like game designers that can make the levels and game programmers who are you that can implement stuff. So here's an important note. All GX, GY, so GX and GY are going to be grid coordinates. All GX, GY positions given in the level specification file are in grid coordinates. The grid cells are of size 64 by 64 pixels, and the entity should be positioned such that the bottom left corner of its texture is aligned with the bottom left corner of the given coordinate. The grid starts at 00, zero in the bottom left of the screen and can be seen by pressing the G key while the game is running. So this, um, I'll show you now. So if I press the G key, it shows me the grid. So this is the grid that's used to specify the level file geometry, okay? Now, I understand that SFML, it, its coordinate system is zero, zero in the top left, but our system has things like gravity, right? And it's really, it's much easier to think about level design if you place zero, zero in the bottom left, okay? So our level geometry is specified in a different coordinate system than in which you are drawing it. Essentially the Y is just flipped, okay? So in the bottom left, you can see here zero, zero, 0, 01, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, 0, 05. All right. Now, that means that if I specify, for example, uh, this tile, okay, if this tile is to appear at 
five three, which it is, then the bottom left of this tile should be in the bottom left of this tile. Now, all of our regular tiles in the game, like bricks, question marks, ground tiles, um, and blocks, which I have over here, uh, if I can see a block, these, these, the size of all of those match the grid cell. So that's fine. So here, if I, if I have these tiles, if I'm trying to place these tiles, they are of the same size as the grid cell. They are 64 by 64 pixels. So if I want to figure out the bottom left corner, so the bottom left position of any of these tiles is simply 64 times the x-coordinate and 64 times the y-coordinate. However, the y-coordinate is flipped, right? Because for SFML, 0, 0 is in the top left. So just keep that in mind, okay? If you figure out, for example, 0, 0, well, you're going to have to take the height of the the height of the window, right? The height of the whole window and subtract that Y coordinate. So I'm not going to get too much into that math because I want you to figure out that math, right? And we'll go into there's a function that I'll explain a little bit more about that when inside the, um, the scene and I'll explain how you're going to do that there. Essentially, all of your, um, your entities, even for example, this bush in the background, this bush is bigger than a tile. But as the specification says, you have to place this entity with, with this texture so that the texture aligns with the bottom left of the specified tile. So this bush here is specified at tile 01. And so you have to figure out how big its animation is and then do the math such that you are placing it so that the bottom left corner of that animation lines up with the with the bottom left of the tile that is specified to go in. Okay, so hopefully that's that's a little bit intuitive. But that's the grid. You can toggle it with the G key and just realize that again, SFML's 00, zero coordinate is in the top left, but the 00, zero grid coordinate is in the bottom left. Okay. All right. So there are a bunch of different tiles in the level file. They are very, very intuitive, and the level file specification shouldn't be that bad. So let's open up a level file, and we'll look at it. Well, essentially, <laughs> there's tiles, there's decks, and there's the player. Okay, so let me go over this specification with you. I'll move this down. So tiles. Tiles have a name, a grid X, and a grid Y. That's it. So for example, we have tile ground zero, zero. So in the very bottom left of the of the level, there is a, a tile and it has the ground animation. Right next to that, so one grid cell to the right, so it's X1, Y0, there's another ground and another ground and a bunch more ground. There's a lot of ground in this level, right? But look at this, there is a deck. So again, decorations are just like tiles except they have no bounding boxes, right? So they don't do any collision. So this deck, is called bush big, that is the animation that it's given, and the bottom left of this animation should be at the bottom left of tile one zero. So you have to specify, you have to figure out that math in your assignment. And if we look down the other, only other thing, so this level is just a whole bunch of placements of bricks, blocks, and questions and stuff like that in pole. And so you have to figure all, when you design a level, you are essentially creating your own level using this specification. All you got to do is copy and paste and change the X, Y values and just make a level that's kind of interesting. The last thing and the most complicated thing is the player. And I have the player here at the end. The player has a bunch of different things. It is GX, GY first. So that is the grid cell of the spawn location of the player. So the spawn location of the player is where it starts the level and where it appears after it dies. Next is CW and CH. That is the bounding box width and height in pixels. Okay, so the bounding box width and height in pixels. Um, SX, SY, that is the um, left and right speed, SX, and the jumping speed, SY. I'll explain what jumping speed means in a minute. SM, 
that is the maximum speed. So Mario or Mega Man can never exceed this speed in any direction. GY is gravity. So gravity is essentially acceleration. And B is the bullet animation. So the bullet animation B I have here has, as Buster. But the cool thing about this is if I have this as, say, stand, right? Um, then I rerun the game. And now when Mario shoots bullets, he's shooting standing Mega Man's, right? So we specify all this stuff in the config file so that we can do cool stuff in the game. So this is the Buster. That's the name of Mega Man's default gun. So we're just going to keep it like that. So before we get into um, the code, I do want to reiterate a little bit about the level geometry. So let us do this. I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Then I'm going to try... Oh, my, my thing isn't working. One second. I'm going to... PowerPoint. My um, stream deck apparently stopped working. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to click things manually then. So just give me one sec. I got to bring up my blackboard. Here we go. There we go. Do, do, do. All right, where's my blackboard? Hang on a sec. Stupid stream deck. Hey, there we go. All righty. So that's actually a bit small. So let me go back and take another screenshot. And this time I'm going to take a smaller selection of the level, bring it in here. Okay, resize. Let's make that about 400% bigger. Hey, there we go. Okay, now I'm in the blackboard. Now we've got what we want. All right, perfect. So here in the level, um, I just want to explain again all of the geometry here because it's a little bit um, confusing if you've never done something like this before. So over here, I've got um, the width and the height. I'm going to make this a bit bigger. The width and the height of all of my cells, they are 64 by 64. So the grid size is 64 by 64 pixels. All right. So if I ever want to find out, for example, what is the bottom left coordinate of 1, 3? of grid cell one, three. Well, that is X equals one times 64. Y equals three times 64. So that is the bottom left of this, all right? Now, we explained something previously that we are going to be assigning the middle of entities. So the position of an entity is now going to be its middle. So in order to do that, I am going to first load the thing. Where is that function? Here we go. All right. So let me go back to here. Oops. All righty. So inside, I'm not going to get into all the code yet because I want to finish all the geometry related stuff first. So, but inside your scene class, you're going to have this grid to mid pixel function. What that is going to do is you're going to be passed in a grid X and a grid Y, and you're also going to be passed in an entity whose, whose um, animation has already been given um, its size. Okay, so it's already been given an animation. So here's what happens in this function. This function takes in a grid x, y position and an entity. It returns a vec2 indicating where the center position of the entity should be. You must use the entity's animation size to position it correctly. The size of the grid, width and height is stored here. Okay, so that's the grid size.x and grid size.y. That's going to be 64 and 64 for our assignment. The bottom left corner of the animation should align with the bottom left corner of the grid cell. So what does that mean 
exactly. Well, we're going to go back to our blackboard. All right. So let's say that I want to position an entity and that entity has a size 64 by 64. Okay. So here's my entity. Oh, hang on a second. Let me just, uh, what's the best way to do this? I'm going to make this a bit thicker. So here's my entity. I want to position this entity. It has size 64 by 64. And I want to position it here at tile 1-3. Now, what we have to do is we have to figure out how to position this so that the center of this entity, we're, we're figuring out the center of the entity, okay? But we want the bottom left to align with the bottom left of this. So what I would recommend is you first figure out the size of the, of the animation of the entity, right? So if we go back into our code, we see there's, there's in the, the, uh, the readme file, there is the actual, uh, line of code that you use to get the animation and get the size of the animation. So for tiles, that's going to be 64 by 64. And so it's very easy to line that up, right? Because it's already the same size. But let's say, for example, you have this bush entity, which may actually be this size, which is some strange size, right? Well, what you have to do is you have to first figure out how you would align the bottom left pixel. Well, sorry, your goal is to figure out how you would align the bottom left pixel of this entity, okay, with this animation size, so that its bottom left touches the bottom left of cell 01, because that's where you want it to be. If I wanted this to be, let's say it was specified to be at 1, 3, then it would be positioned right here like this. Or 0, 0, it would be positioned right here like this. So what this function does is that you are passed in the X and Y location where that entity should be lined up to the bottom left of that grid X and Y, and you're also given the entity, right? And that entity has a size. And what you're trying to do here is you are returning the middle position of that entity, okay? So if we go back to the blackboard, oh, I've lost my blackboard, one second. If we go back to the blackboard here, then if this entity with this thick bush entity was given 0, 1, then the position that this function is returning is somewhere right here, the very center of that entity, okay? So it's up to you to figure that math out. If I do it here, I basically do that part of the assignment for you. So I want you to actually go and figure that out. So again, you're given the X and Y and the entity, you figure out the entity's animation size, and then you place it such that the bottom left lines up with the bottom left of the tile that's specified, and you figure out the center point, okay? Now I know that that sounds like a whole bunch of weird work for nothing, but we are using the center point for all of our collision calculations. So it will end up being easier for us in the long run if you just do this function once. All right, so the only other thing that we need to worry about is that for this assignment, gravity is pulling us on the screen downward, okay? So gravity is pulling us downward, but just keep in mind that the SFML coordinate space has zero, zero at the top left. And so gravity has a positive value because it is accelerating us downward, which in SFML has a, um, a positive value. So just realize that it's, yes, it's a little bit confusing, but I think that in the long run, it, it's actually more intuitive once you get used to it. We are specifying our levels with zero, zero in the bottom left because it's a little bit more intuitive to do that. But still the SFML system in the background does things with zero, zero in the top left. Okay, so just 
just rem remember that. Okie doke. So um, let me get out of this view. God, it's so much easier with the Stream Deck. There we go. So we're going to go back to the readme file real quick. Um, there are some hints here. I'll go over the hints later. And what I'm going to do now is go over the code. So, all right. So this is the code that you're going to be given. There are a lot of files in this assignment, but you should be used to this many files by now. Okay. So when you, by default, when you load the assignment, um, there is now, for example, an action class. Okay. We talked about the action class. Um, there is an animation class. So we talked about the animation class. There's the entity manager has been finished for you. Okay. So you don't need to, to redo the entity manager that is done for you. Um, the game engine class is, is here now. We see that the game engine has been separated. So we have a game engine and we have scenes. So here's the game engine. Um, here is our scene base class. Here is our scene menu class. Here is our scene play class. So we have all of these things separated. We have exactly what we said we were going to do when we talked about the assignment three architecture. Um, up here, uh, what I've done is there are a lot of files here, but the only files that you are going to be working on yourself are um, these three files. So the animation class, the physics class, and the scene play class, okay? The animation class, you are going to be implementing the update function. So the update function has all of those variables that we were talking about for animations in our lecture. You are just going to calculate the correct frame of animation based on current frame and speed and set the texture rectangle accordingly. So on every frame of the game, each entity's animation update function is called. Let me try and make that a bit bigger for you. And you are just implementing these things here. And then the last thing you have to do is implement when and, and detect when an animation has ended and accordingly return true when the animation has ended. So the animation class is probably one of the last things that you actually want to do because you want to get all your physics and stuff working correctly. But the animation class, that is where, um, that's where you're doing all the animation related stuff. So that's the animation class. It's very simple. The calculation is very straightforward. Next is the physics class. So the physics class has two functions. One is get overlap and the other one is get previous overlap. And if you go back a few lectures to our axis aligned bounding box um, lecture, you will remember that we had get overlap. And so get overlap is return the overlap rectangle size of bounding boxes of entity A and entity B. So what you have to do in here is first check to see that A and B actually have bounding boxes. Maybe check to see that they have transform components. And if they both have transforms and they both have bounding boxes, then you're going to compute and return this VEC2. We've already gone over all of that math. Get previous overlap is the exact same function as get overlap, except you are going to be using the previous positions instead of the current positions. So if I go over to the components, you will see that every entity not only stores its current position, but it stores its previous position as well. So previous position is the position of that entity of that entity on the previous frame of the game. Okay. So over here, if we go back to physics, once you get this function working, you can copy it, paste it down here. And instead of position, you're using previous position. So this get overlap and get previous overlap, those are the two functions. We went over the mathematics of those in that lecture. So you can just load up that lecture, you can watch it and you can implement these functions. And this is going to be the core, the real core of your, um, your collision system in your gameplay. So over here, the last thing is this scene play. And if you look, there are a number of things that you have to do for this class. So we'll go through them all now. So we'll go from top to bottom. Why not? So this is the play scene. This is the scene that gets loaded when Mario is actually 
or sorry, when Mega Man is actually running around the level, that's all that you have to implement for this. I've already done the menu scene for you. So first you have to implement the init function. All right, so um, I'm just reading one of the comments in the chat. It wasn't a question, so that's fine. So the first thing that you have to do, well, maybe not the first thing, but one of the things that you have to do is you have to register all of the other gameplay actions. So if you recall back to our actions and replays lecture, the way we are doing things now is a little bit different. Um, instead of immediately reading actions and saying like, oh, the W key was pressed, I should jump. What we have now is the following system where in the game engine, and I already went over what the game engine does and how it switches scenes and all that kind of stuff. In the user input function, or in the user input system, it will do exactly what we said. It will ask the current scene if it has an action associated with this key press. If it does, it will determine whether it's the start or end of that action, and then tell the scene to do that action. But in order to do that, here is where we register our actions, okay? So for example, we've already registered pause, quit, toggle textures, toggle collisions, toggle grid. Oh, I guess I should show you what happens when you initially run the game. So the code that you are given um, does the following when you run it. So here it is. Um, it does nothing. <laughs> okay, so I've done some example uh, loading of textures for you. Let me make that full screen again. That is not what it should be. One second. Let me run this again. All right, so here is what you get when you first get the assignment. You can still toggle the textures. You can toggle the uh, bounding boxes. You can toggle the grid, but there's no movement. There's no gameplay whatsoever. So you start, you're starting with a lot of this done for you. So, but there's still a lot left to do, okay? So this is what you're given by default. So what you have to do here, for example, is you would type register action sf keyboard w and then you give it a name of the thing that you're supposed to do when the w key is pressed so for example it'll be jump right then you would do a you would do d you give those names and now whenever i press the w key i'm going to have in my function down here my do action function what i can do down down here is say else if action.name equals jump, then I'm going to do whatever should happen when I actually jump in the game. Okay, so that's how I add an action. It's really simple. I register it up in the init function, and then I call it right here. Really, really simple to add new actions and rebind keys and, and do all sorts of cool stuff. So this is our new action system. That's how we do it. And so for example, here, we would take m player we would get their input component. Oh, I, I have a different way of doing that now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this and show you how we do that later because we have a new way of, of doing things with entities. But that's the very first thing you do is you just register the actions. Okay? Perfect. Um, let's actually go through the config file and we see what, let's see what we should do in what order. All right. Because there's a lot of stuff to do and a lot of stuff depends on all the other stuff. So, oh geez, I just hit a glass on my desk. So let's go back now. When you're ready to start programming the assignment, you should come look at the assignment hints. So I recommend approaching the assignment in the following order, which will help you debug your program along, with, along the way with minimal errors. Remember to do one step at a time and test whether what you have just implemented is working properly before moving on to additional steps. So don't just code the whole assignment and hope that it'll work, okay? So rendering system has already been um, set up for you. To help you debug, you can press these keys to toggle on various things to make sure that your bounding boxes are in the right places, that your animations are the right size, that they're playing properly, right? So all this is, is done for you. Um, you can implement animation update and animation has ended at any time because it just affects the animations. It doesn't affect the gameplay. So if you want to do animations first, fine. If you want to do animations at the very end, also fine. 
Um, the animations are are not going to be the thing that that hinders or helps your gameplay programming whatsoever. So the very first thing that I recommend doing is loading the level because that way you can get everything drawn to the screen and you can start testing, okay? So since rendering is already completed, once you correctly read in the different types of entities and add them to the entity manager, they should automatically be drawn to the screen for you. Add the correct bounding boxes to tile entities and no bounding boxes to the deck entities. Remember, you can toggle debug viewing of the bounding boxes and the textures with the T and C keys. As part of this step, implement the scene play grid to mid pixel function, which takes in as parameters a grid X, Y position and an entity and returns a VEC2 position of the center of that entity. You must use the animation size of the entity to determine where its center point should be. Keep in mind that this means your entity must have its C animation components added first so that it can be used to calculate the midpoint in that function. So that is what I recommend doing first right after you register the keys, is implement this grid to mid pixel function. And I highly recommend what whenever anyone has come to me with a question this term about math or how you do a specific function like this, I highly recommend getting out a pencil and a piece of paper and drawing a little grid and actually doing an example by hand. And as soon as you've done an example by hand, you can translate exactly what you did into code and it'll work. I, I promise you it'll work. This function looks a little bit scary, but it really is the very first thing that you should get working. And then once you load in all your entities from the level, if this function works properly, the whole level should just be drawn to the screen for you automatically because the rendering system is already done. So do this grid to mid pixel function that I've already explained um, first. Next, implement the scene play spawn player. So read the player configuration from the level file and spawn the player. This is where the player should restart when they die. So let's actually look at the load level function. Okay, so in the load level function, the first thing that you want to do when you load the load a level is reset the entity manager. So you can just delete the entity manager and put a new one in there. That just re literally overwrites the previous entity manager and cleans up the last one. So read uh, the first thing you do, reset the entity manager. Then you read in the level file, which is specified by file name and add the appropriate entities. Use the player config struct and the M player config the M player config variable to store the player properties. This struct is defined at the top of scene play.h. So if we go to scene play.h, we have this player config struct, and that is what you're going to use to actually store all these variables for the player. So just like you read in a bunch of variables for assignment two and assignment one, you're doing the same thing for this one, but they're just the player variables. Um, note, all of the code below is just sample code, which shows you how to set up and use entities with the new syntax. It should be removed. So you're going to call spawn player in here, and then you're going to, like after you've read in all of those things, you're going to call spawn player. Spawn player will read from those variables. But what I have here now is some new syntax for working with entities. So if we look over, at the entity class, we'll see that a number of things have changed. Now, it might be a little bit confusing at first. However, it's more efficient and it ends up being nicer to use. So what is all this new stuff? Well, instead of having like what we used to have for the entity, I'm surprised I don't have slides on this. Oh, well. Um, what we used to have for the entity was a bunch of public shared pointers to components. Now, the problem with that was that it was a little bit cumbersome to add and remove components and all that kind of stuff. And it was also very not cache friendly to do it like that. And we want to set up as few shared pointers as possible. So what I have done in, in this assignment and for all future assignments is now the entity stores a tuple of components. So, really handily, 
Um, what we would like to have is a container of components, right? And rather than have to go like create a base class of, how, how am I going to explain this? I, sh I really should have had a slide on this and I apologize that I didn't. This tuple is essentially like, you can have a pair, a triple, a quadruple, and N tuple is, is a tuple, right? That is the data structure. So we now have something that I'm calling a component tuple. And that component tuple is a tuple of all of our different types of components. These are stored contiguously in memory, kind of like if they were in an array, but this is not an array. And what it lets us do is it lets us do the following. So if I have a component, or sorry, if I have this data structure, a tuple, so let's just say I have a standard tuple of int, double, and char, and I'm gonna call that um, my tuple. Okay, if I have a tuple like this, it's going to store an int, it's going to store a double, it's going to store a char. Now you may ask yourself, okay, but how do I get access to those things if those things don't have variable names, right? So the way we can do that is really cool. So I can say um, standard get int and then pass in my tuple. And that will get me the integer Oh, sorry, I, this is going to say it's a syntax error because it's in the header file, but it's not a syntax error. So if I say standard get int my tuple, this returns me the integer from the tuple. So what we can do now, if we have this tuple, geez, what's going on here? If I have this tuple of all the different component types, what I can say is standard get uh, C transform from M components and that will give me the transform from the components. So C++ luckily has this really nice way of storing a bunch of different types of things in this tuple container. And without having to worry about giving them variable names or anything, I can just say, give me the transform from that container or give me the animation from that container. And I can also set things within there, et cetera, et cetera. So what this affords me now is that instead of having to manually set the variable, for example, for my transform component, I can now use this system and now I can now have templated functions. So I can now have a function called add component. I can now have a function called get component. I can now have a function called remove component and I can have a function called has component. So now my entity class has really nice functions that um, set up all of our components for us. So let's see how that works. And then I'll come back, like how we're going to use this. And then I'll come back and I'll explain it a little bit. So now if I want to set up an entity, I'm going to use the following uh, syntax. So let's set up some sample entities. So just like before, I'm going to say auto brick equals m entity manager dot add tile tile. Okay, so that's going to be a tile entity, my brick. If I want to add a component, instead of saying like brick arrow c transform equals standard make shared whatever, all I have to do now is say hey brick, add component c animation, and then pass in the constructor arguments for the animation. That's it. If I want to add component, C transform, that's all I have to do, right? So now I have an add component function. Note, your final code should position an entity with the grid X, Y position read from the file. So here is what you're gonna actually do when you load a level, is you will say brick, add component, C transform, and then you will call that grid to mid pixel function with the grid, uh, X and the grid Y and the brick. All right, so after you've added the animation, then you call this. I'm not doing it right now because I don't have that function implemented. Um, in order to get components, you can say brick get component C animation. There you go. And also um, you can say things like, if you want to know if brick 
has component C animation. That will check to see if the component act, if if the entity actually has that component. And you can also say brick remove component C animation. So those four functions now, add component, get component, has component, and remove component, that is the new architecture of our entity class. And it makes them a lot easier to work with, trust me. So, so that's, that's pretty nice. Um, if you want to know how that works, well, you can just look at this code. It's, it's really not that, that, that difficult. All I'm doing is saying standard get. That, that's it. I'm saying standard get and then setting the things in the component and then returning it. And at the very end of this, this is incredibly important now. This is, this is a new thing that's happening that's very important with the syntax for how you work with entities and components. Components are now returned as references rather than pointers. So just watch this. See this? My get component is returning a reference. Get component is returning a reference. Okay? So that means if you do not specify a reference variable type, it will copy the component instead of giving you a reference to it. So this will copy the transform into a variable transform1. It is incorrect. Any changes that you make to transform1 will not be changed inside the entity. So for example, sometimes it's very nice to set up a variable to, for example, the transform of an entity, because you're gonna be working with that transform a lot and you don't want to call entity.getTransform a bunch of times. So if you just say auto transform equals entity get C transform, this is returning a reference. This is setting up a new variable. And so this will actually copy that entire component and store it here. You are not referencing the, the component within the entity properly. So any changes you make to transform one will not be reflected inside that entity. You have to specifically say that it's a reference. So this line of code will reference the transform. So you're saying auto reference transform equals entity get transform. So if you are setting up variables to components that you want to work with, please make sure that you use auto transform like this. So for example, in your physics, maybe you're looking at, um, you can say uh, C transform and you're trying to set up a pointer to the transform of, of A, right? Because I'm going to be saying, okay, A, get component, C transform, uh, like this, C transform dot pause. So I'm going to be looking at the position of this, of this entity a lot, right? So this A, get component, C transform, that's a bit verbose. Th this, I probably don't want to be calling that all the time. So if I do want to set up a variable to this, either to the component or to the position within the component, so I would say auto pause equals this with a reference, okay? If I don't have the reference here, then I'm copying the positions vec2, so this is a vec2, and I'm copying it. So if I then say pause2 or pause.x equals 12, then it's not actually changing the position within the entity it's only changing this local variable. Now I'm changing it within the entity, okay? So make sure, and again, if you're setting up um, a, if you want to have a variable pointing to the transform, which is, you know, sometimes you want to do that, you could say auto TA. This is what I do sometimes, oops. Auto TA equals A's transform. So it's a reference, to the transform of A. And now down here, you can say ta.pause.x instead of A get component C transform dot pause dot X. It's just very verbose, right? So you can do that if you want to, that's fine. But just make sure that you have this reference. <laughs> it's very important. Oh, none, nothing will work if you do it the incorrect way. So you'll learn very quickly. All right, so that's the new way that we deal with entities. So we'll have a nice chapter in this video for that. Next. What I would do next is implement basic 
uh, WASD up, down, left, and right movement for the player entity so you can use it to help test collisions in the future. Remember that you must use register action to register a new action for the scene. See the actions um, already registered for you and the sdo action function for syntax on how to perform actions. So what do I mean by that? Well, here we go back here. I'm going to, let's say I'm going to, I'm going to do one for you. So I can copy this syntax, paste it down here, say W is going to be up. Now I know in our game, we have left, right, and jump, but it might be useful for you to implement up, down, left, and right, just to test out your collision code, for example. So if I implement up here as an action, then I go down to my do action. I'm going to have up, right? So maybe now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say M player get component C input dot uh, up equals true, right? So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to set that component. Uh, sorry, the input component up is equal to true. Now what I do is in my movement system, I do what I did in assignment two. So I can say for my player, if my player has the up component set to true, then decrease its Y value, for example. Okay, so that's how I would, I would do that. I would say, for example, well, let's just, let's just do one of those examples. So if M player um, get component C input dot up, Then what do I want to do here? I want to say, well, first, I want to vec2 player uh, velocity. And that's going to be 0, 0. I'm going to say player velocity dot uh, y equals negative 3. Let's do something like that. Or maybe negative 1, because that's going to be really fast. So, or no, negative 3 is fine. Then I'm going to say down here, M player C or get component C transform dot velocity equals player velocity, right? So I'm, I'm setting up a new variable to store the velocity from the inputs. Then I'm saying this is now my player velocity. And where else am I doing? Okay, so I'm not, and then I'm gonna say M player get, uh, so for auto E in M, uh, what do we have here? Entities, entity manager dot get entities. For the entity manager, I'm gonna say E get component C transform dot position plus equals velocity, right? So everything's velocity is going to be added to its position. So now let's see if this works. Might not work right off the bat. I'm going to have to debug this a little bit, but here's what you get. If I hit W, now my player's velocity goes up. Okay, so that's how you add the inputs. Um, and oops, what I didn't do was the opposite of this. One second, I'm trying to find this. Ah, so if this is equal to up in the end, so this is the end of my action. Now I want to set this to false, okay? So this is how I'd, I'd set that. Now I'm gonna come back because it, before it was setting it to true but never unsetting it. So now if I press W, Right now I've got my player moving up. And what you can do is I would recommend setting up up, down, left, and right, no animations, no nothing. So that now I could say, implement my collisions and just try and move Mega Man into a block, right? Just with up, down, left, and right. Then later you're going to worry about jumping. And with jumping, well, Mega Man is going to have a gravity component. So in your movement system, Where's that movement system? 
Um, Mega Man also has a gravity component. So for here, gravity is an acceleration of velocity. So if we look at what that's going to do, essentially you're going to say my velocity is going to plus equal my gravity component here. Oh, what's that? Oh, my float is gravity in the x direction. So that's the y. Okay. So if I have gravity, gravity is adding to my y velocity at every frame. So if, now that's going to crash because not everything has gravity. So I'm going to say if, now this is a good example for your programming. If E has component C gravity, then I will do gravity. Okay. So if it has a gravity component, I don't want it to crash if it doesn't. So that's what I'm going to do. And then down here in my spawn player, where's spawn player? Here it is. I'm going to give it a small gravity component. So M player, add component, C gravity. And this is going to be like 0 0.1. So if the player has a gravity component, What's going to happen? It's going to start falling. Oh, is it falling slower and slower? Oh, I know why. Because I want to maintain my Y velocity from my player. And so up here, this player velocity, I want to actually maintain that so I can say, M player get C transform dot velocity dot Y. All right. So I want to maintain my Y velocity. So now it's going to be adding and adding and adding to that. There we go. So now velocity is going to accelerate me downward. Okay. Let's watch that again. Oh, I don't have the escape key set up. And so that's how you do this. All right. This is, you're going to be adding and adding and adding functionality to all the different things that you have. All right. So let's get rid of all of that. So that's gravity. Um, that's pretty easy to implement. And just remember that there's actually one more step to gravity. And that is we don't want the player to go infinitely fast in a particular direction. So if we look back at the readme, there's actually on the player, there's a max speed. And so you have to say like, um, you have to check. And here you would say, if the player is moving faster than max speed, in any direction, set its speed in that direction to the max speed. So let me go back and look at the, um, uh, one second, solution. Okay, this is important also about gravity, is that every frame of the game, gravity is pulling me down. Right? So the way that I implement jumping is just by giving my player's Y velocity an initial component, right? So if I say my Y velocity is negative 10 or something, then it's going to be initially moving up and then it's going to, gravity is all, excuse me, always pulling me down. But what's happening is whenever I collide with this thing, I'm detecting the collision, I'm detecting that overlap and I'm pushing myself up by the overlap. So there's two important things to remember. If I didn't bound my speed of gravity, I would be continuously moving downward, continuously accelerating downward so fast that I would eventually drop through this, this tile, right? I'd be moving so fast. So you've ever seen something uh, like some glitches in like Super Mario 64 with people being able to move through walls going backwards? That's because they did not, they forgot to limit the backward speed of Mario in Super Mario 64. And you can't patch an N64 game, right? So they would eventually be able to go through things um, due to that. So we have to limit our, our speed due to gravity. And also, you can see here that if I drop, like, and then fall, I'm, whenever I touch the ground, I'm resetting my Y velocity to zero. Because I don't want to have, like if I, if I jump from gravity here, 
I want my gravity, like my Y velocity to kind of reset to zero. So one other tip is when you land somewhere, reset your player's Y velocity to zero so that gravity has to start all over again. Okay, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Cool. So what's the next thing that you should do? Let's go back to the tips. Um, okay, so we just did this where we implemented some basic movement and we did gravity. Now, implement player spawn bullet. So the bullet should shoot when the space key is pressed in the same direction, direction that a player is facing. Holding down the space button should not continuously fire bullets. A new bullet can only be fired after the space key has been released. You can use the uh, input.canshoot variable to implement this. So the way you do that is really easy. Um, can shoot means you're ready to shoot. When you push down the space bar, you shoot and then can shoot becomes false. And then when you release the space bar, can shoot becomes true. Really easy to implement that. So that's the bullet spawning. Then I would implement the physics get overlap. So this is the actual collisions. So this function should return the overlap dimensions between the bounding boxes of two entities. This is the same as the purple rectangle that I showed in class. Get previous overlap should be a copy and paste of this solution, except using the previous positions instead of the current positions of the entities. If either entity has no bounding box, then return zero, zero. And then you implement collision checking, checking uh, with bullets and brick tiles, such that the bullet, uh, the brick is destroyed when the bullet collides with it. Remember, a collision occurs when the overlap is non-zero in both the X and the Y component. So once you have get overlap, you call get overlap between a bullet and a brick. And if both of those are zero are, are greater than zero, then you know they're colliding and you can destroy both of them. Now, so let's look in here in our uh, class, we have a collision function. So that collision function, I'm saying implement the bullet and tile collisions first, destroy the tile if it has a brick animation. So bullets should be destroyed whenever they hit any tile, but if it hits a brick tile, the brick should be destroyed as well. So remember that SFML00 position is in the top left corner. This means jumping will have a negative Y component and gravity has a positive Y component. Something below something else will have a Y value greater than it and something above something else will have a Y value less than it. You already know that, but I'm just putting it in here to, to remind you. Um, okay, so that's the bullet tile collisions. Next, implement collision resolution such that when a player collides with a non-decorative tile, the player cannot enter it or overlap it. When the player collides with a tile from below, its Y velocity should be set to zero so that it falls back downward and doesn't hover below the tile. And then implement a way of detecting which side the player collided with the tile, right? So what does that mean? Well, we'll go back to our blackboard for a second. Uh, okay, where's my blackboard? Here we go. All right, so we have our blackboard. Uh, it is almost working. All right, now the blackboard's working. So let's say we have two tiles. So I'm going to do them in black here. So this is a tile, and let's say that this is a bullet, okay? The bullet has a bounding box, the tile has a bounding box. You are going to use the physics get overlap to detect when there is an overlap in the X and Y direction between the two, and if there's an overlap, the bullet is destroyed, and if this is a brick, then the brick is also destroyed. Done. The second type of collision is if the player hits a tile from below, it should be pushed downward, right? If it hits it from above, it should be pushed upward. If it's hit from below, like this, if this is a brick, it should be destroyed. So you need to detect that, okay, it was from below. Now, the, the hints here what I, that I said in the readme file was that if the if one object is below another object, it's actually going to have a higher Y value. So zero zero is in the top left. So this Y2 is going to be bigger than Y1. 
So you can detect if it hit from below by knowing that Y2 was greater than Y1. Similarly, if this thing was on top, it would have a lesser Y2. So if the player lands on a brick from above, right, and there's a collision, you're just going to push it back out and he's going to stand there. If it hits from below, you're going to set the player's Y velocity to zero and the brick is going to be destroyed. Okay, so that's, and it's, and the, the, the explosion animation plays. And similarly, with a question mark tile, so if this is a question mark tile like this, if um, the player hits from below, uh, it's going to change the question mark tile, and a coin is going to appear up here. If it hits it from above, you're just going to stand on it. Okay, that's, that's, it's pretty simple physics once you get the uh, get overlap function done. Um, once you have gotten collisions working, then change the controls such that they are, you know, you had up, down, left, and right. Now you're going to want the proper left, right, jump style controls. All movement logic should be in the movement system. The do action system is only to set the proper C input variables. If you do modify the player's speed or position any inside, anywhere inside the do action system, oh geez, I'm reading something and you can't see it. Sorry, I'm just reading this here. Uh, let me read that again. Change that to control, control so they are the proper left, right jump style. So you're going to implement jumping. Um, just had to ban someone, spammer in the chat. All right. All movement logic should be done in the movement system. The do action system is only to be used to set the proper input variables. If you do modify the player's speed or position anywhere, you will lose marks in, in the do action system. And... Next, the last thing is, once you've done all of that, implement gravity so that the player falls toward the bottom of the screen and lands on a tile when it collides with a tile from above. Note that when the player lands on a tile from above, you should set its vertical speed to zero so that gravity does not continue to accelerate the player downward. That's it. That's the assignment. Um, let me look through again here to see if there's anything I missed. Of course, you will be implementing um, lifespan, because the bullets are going to have uh, some lifespan. Um, the animation system. This is where uh, you are going to complete, complete the animation class first. And then, inside the animation system, you are also going to set the proper animation based on the, the, the state component of the player. So if we look over at components, there is now a state component, and that just contains a string that you can use to set whatever you want. So for example, if Mario is jumping, you can have the state as jumping. If they're standing, you can have the state as standing. If they're running, the state can be running. And then in here, you can do something like the following. So if M player um, get component C state dot state equals jumping or air let's say whatever it happens to be then you can say m player set or get component or add component c animation and then in here i'm going to add the proper constructor for the animation class which if i look over here is a name a texture, a for, okay. So, oh, actually, I have to look at my assets, which are here. And this is the air animation. So I can say M game assets dot get animation air. There we go. So this is how I set the animation of my player based on the state. So up here somewhere in my collision system, I'm going to detect, oh, I'm not colliding with anything, I must be in the air. If I'm colliding with the ground, then I'm either standing or running, right? So up in my movement system, if Mario is moving, then I'm gonna set, okay, M player um, dot get component, oh, sorry, get component C state, dot state equals um, run, something like that. Okay, so if I've detected that I should be running, 
then set my state to running so that down here in the animation, I can say now, if this is run, then set it to run. Okay, and I need one more thing here. So this is how you're setting the animation of the player. Similarly, when you detect that a brick has been hit, you'll set the animation like this. Now it says add component. So intuitively, this might sound like you're adding a second animation component, but add component overwrites the previous component, okay? And then all you have to do is, uh, the last thing is for each animation, call entity get component. That's it. Now, uh, the rendering is all done for you. Luckily, you don't have to touch rendering unless you're doing some bonus stuff. The last thing you have to do is this on end function. And so what you have to do is when the scene ends, you change the game back to the menu scene. And so this is called when you hit escape and you just have to use M game change scene and then figure out the correct parameters to change the scene back to the menu scene. Uh, let's go over just to say that we've covered everything for the collision system. Um, so the collisions, this is where you're gonna be spending most of your time. First is the bullet and tile collisions. Next is the player tile collisions and resolutions. Update the state of the player to store whether it's currently in the ground of the air. Um, check to see if a player has fallen down a hole and don't let the player walk off the left side of the map. So that's all pretty intuitive. We talked about lifespan and uh, implement the pause functionality correctly, call all the systems correctly, spawn the bullet correctly, spawn the player correctly, etc. So I think we've talked about everything. That's about it. I think so. Just want to make sure. Yeah, I think that's it. So just notice the last thing over here, um, I have included in this assignment, this little to do folder, because it's some, sometimes it's a little bit annoying to have to find, like you're only working on three classes for the entirety of this um, assignment. And so I've put those three classes over here. So you can always very easily see, okay, animation, physics, and play, I just have them in this little to-do folder for you. So if you open up the assignment and you're like, holy crap, um, there's no anime, you know what? I should just remove that because people are gonna tell me that there's no, all right, so, so ignore that. There will be no to-do folder when you get it. Um, you're working on the animation class, you're working on the scene play class, and you are working on the physics class. That's it, all right. Thank you so much. I know I went a little bit over time there, but I wanted to explain everything as thoroughly as possible. I think you'll have a lot of fun working on assignment three. It's like, it's a real game and you're getting a real taste for, for game programming now and how fun and also tedious that can be. Um, let me look at the Merc sheet as the last thing I do real quick. So, um, so the animations and the explosions and all that kind of stuff, all that is worth 30%. The gameplay functionality is worth 65%. So very, very detailed marking scheme here for you. Um, hundred percent total and some, some marks I can use here if your code style is bad. So that, that's the marking. It's pretty well, uh, explained here, uh, for you. All right, that's it for the assignment. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have fun with it. I had a lot of fun creating it and um, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.